Hello and welcome back to the Montana Minute. I'm Zach Reamer. Loss and the grief that often follows is something that all people experience when a loved one dies. It's a complicated process that can entail pain and guilt, healing and growth. Sometimes a child who is removed from their primary home because of neglect or abuse can also experience grief. As you'll learn in today's episode, their loss can be complicated and result in a wide range of emotional behaviors as they struggle to adapt to their new environment, sometimes under the care of kind-hearted and well-intentioned but complete strangers. This results in a significant barrier for foster parents and other caregivers who are trying to help these young people cope. To learn about loss and grief, I'll be talking with Marianne Bowman today, a professor at the University of Montana. Marianne is a wealth of knowledge on the subject, so today I'm breaking the episode up into two parts. In part one, you can learn something about grief, which I found out is something of a complex issue. In part two, we'll pivot towards grief and loss, specifically as they pertain to work with children who have been removed from their family. There will definitely be nuggets of wisdom that can generalize to all grief and loss in this second part, so don't skip it. You also don't want to miss the second half, because we'll be talking a lot about what you can do as a helping professional to help children experiencing any kind of grief. And with that, let's get into our conversation with Marianne. Why don't we get started? How does that sound? Great. Okay. Uh, first thing I always like to do is ask you to introduce yourself and okay. tell me a little bit of your background mm-hmm. and you know, your relation to the topic, which is grief and loss. Cool. Yeah. And thanks again for sitting down with me and uh, agreeing to be interviewed. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity because I think the topic is super important. And so I'm, I'm glad to have the chance to talk about it. So my name is Marianne Sontag Bowman, and I'm an, an associate professor here at the University of Montana in the School of Social Work. And I mean, I do the things that professors do, <laughs> of course. But my background for a really long time has been in the areas of grief and loss. And before I came here, which was almost 10 years ago, I worked at a pediatric hospital for five and a half years, and my job was to develop a bereavement program that could serve the hospital but also serve the community. And in the process of doing that, I also got involved with a small team that started a pediatric palliative care program. So what we did was we created a program that has still exists today and yeah. serves has served hundreds and hundreds of families with children who have life-threatening illnesses. I think my involvement in that program is one of the things I'm most proud of in my life. That has been a real, that was a very impactful program. So at the pediatric hospital, I like to say I finished my education Mm -hmm. because before that I was in academia, I had worked as a hospice social worker and bereavement coordinator, but I thought I, and I thought I knew a lot about grief and loss, But when you spend five and a half years immersed in some of the most profound losses that a human being can experience, you realize that a lot of the things you read about in books are actually not true when it's applied to real people. And so it was a humbling, profound experience that even today I feel so honored to have been part of that experience and walked with so many people on their journey. I'm sure that anybody who reads the title of this episode is going to think, oh, this is going to be a sad one. But that is such a positive note to start on, so thank you. Yeah, and you know, I'm glad I did it for as long as I did because the other thing that I was able to see is people recover. Like, if if I would have stopped after just two years, I'm not sure I would have known the truth that people can go through really awful things and they can be okay again. In fact... They can be transformed by their experiences. You never wish they happened, but you can be transformed in really positive ways. Mm-hmm. It sounds like it has an effect on you as oh, well yeah. as the people that you work with. You, When you work in a field like that, you develop a perspective that is a gift. You learn the difference between an inconvenience and a problem in a big, fat hurry. It is really um, an honor to work with people at those kinds of times in their life. And I learned a lot. And I have felt a calling to translate their everything I learned from those people who live that experience and translate that into 
knowledge for other people mm -hmm. so that it can loop back around to bereaved people and they can be they can encounter more informed loved ones and mm -hmm. helpers professional helpers informal helpers and so one of the first things i did when i came here uh, is i developed a website called helpwithgrief.org and that website is um, it stands as when what i say on it as a memorial to all of those people, all those children who died and all of their families as a way to take their experiences and help other people learn from them. And we'll be sure to put that in the description. You know, people can check that out for yeah, themselves. How, can you great. say the website name one more time? It's helpwithgrief helpwithgrief org. all one Perfect. word. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll put that. So tell yeah. me now, drawing on that experience and yeah. your education, what does grief look like and, and what is grief? Yeah. Why, why should people pay attention to people who are in the grieving process? Okay, well, those are super great questions. And I, I, I want to make the point that grief follows any kind of a loss, any loss, if the loss matters to us. So, you know, if I lose my pencil, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not probably going to grieve the pencil unless, of course, it was like the last thing that my loved one gave to me before they left fell off a cliff or whatever. So any loss can precipitate grief and any change can precipitate loss. So I like to think of it in terms of a continuum from there's a change and that results in loss and that results in grief, if it matters. And even happy changes have losses. So when people, you know, I get to move to a new place. Well, I'm so happy about that. Well, think about all the things that you lose when you need, when you move to a new place. And so, you know, life is this constant series of changes, which means it's a constant seri series of losses for all of us. And if the loss matters, then we experience grief. So that's how I think of grief. It's a state of being after a loss that matters to us. And I think the things that I like to remind people is that we tend to think of grief as, as the emotions that come along with grief. So sadness and I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I, I feel guilty. I, I mean, and emotions are, that's absolutely part of grief. Overwhelming emotions are part of grief. All kinds of varied emotions, but emotions are just one part of the experience of grief. Grief is also for most people physical. And the things that I hear the most in terms of physical is feeling exhausted all the time, either not being able to sleep or sleeping all the time, changes in appetite, people will have headaches, people have stomach aches, people will experience chest pains even, but I always say people go, if you have chest pains, go to the hospital, get that mm. checked out. Don't say, I'm sure it's grief, could be a heart attack. But, you know, any disturbing physical symptoms should be checked out. But I like to mention that about chest pain because, or shortness of breath, because that can be a real physical thing. But grief does have physical symptoms. Mm -hmm. That fatigue is the one that people talk about the most in and my I'm, experience. And I'm guessing, you know, you said go seek help if you have these serious concerns for heart, like chest yeah. pain or shortness yeah. of breath. But you know, maybe go seek help if you are experiencing all of these symptoms of grief and you've just had a loss in your life. Yeah, that's actually a really <clears throat> interesting point that let's come back to that yeah, about sure. like, when should we seek help for grief? Because grief is a normal experience. We yeah. all experience grief. And also from the perspective of somebody who's witnessing a family yes. member or somebody to work with, how can you go how can in there you help? and say, yeah, I, I'm ready to help you. I think yep. you're experiencing grief. And... Yep. So let's talk about that. I yeah. want to mention that grief, in addition to being emotional and physical, has a social implication mm. as well, which we don't always consider enough. But grief makes you realize what matters. Mm. And so suddenly someone's talking about, you know, some minor thing, you know, I locked my keys in the car and they're just having a meltdown about locking their keys in the car. And you just want to say to them, get a real problem. Like you locked your keys in the car. My son died. And so what people do is they tend to withdraw from their typical social encounters because they seem so trivial and they seem so meaningless. And Grieving people have very short fuses, so we're actually really glad sometimes that they want to withdraw because that keeps people from getting punched, I think, mm -hmm. sometimes. Blowing up, right? Uh-huh. 
so and social the social implications of grief too can be manifest in this way where people don't want to be around crowds of people including family so for instance i worked with a mom who lost a child at 13. she avoids family gatherings to this day because of course all the cousins are the same age and so when she goes to them she knows that's where her daughter's place should be and she sees all these other kids growing up i don't see that as problematic at all it's not that she's cut off from the family she just doesn't want them in big doses even now that has been i think it's been 10 years so social the social changes that happen with grief are really normal and the other thing that happens with grief in addition to having wild emotions physical symptoms social symptoms is it's perfectly normal to have sort of a spiritual crisis like how like how did this happen why did god let this happen to me how could there be a just god or maybe somebody doesn't believe in god but you know spirituality is how we make meaning and so all of a sudden what we've used to make meaning with our life has just been it's been challenged in a way maybe it never has before. And so then we're questioning like what matters? Like nothing matters. Mm-hmm. That's really normal after someone has, has had a big loss is this sense of like meaninglessness. Nothing matters, nothing makes sense anymore. And that's a spiritual crisis. And then the other thing that I think is really interesting that people don't consider enough is that grief also has cognitive implications. It's really normal for grieving people to not remember things, to not be able to process information well. I think of it as as if they've had a concussion. It's not a physical concussion, but their brain, it's like their brains are saturated. They cannot take anything in, and so things are all jumbled. And when I worked at the hospital, sometimes staff would get perhaps frustrated like you know and say I told that family this six times and it's like yeah you did and that's normal that the person cannot remember the information that you shared because they're in a crisis so when people ask me you know like what is grief yes it's the sadness it's the crying it's all of that but grief is emotional it's physical it's social it's spiritual it's cognitive it's a state of being It follows any loss and you're never done. Like, it's not like you have closure. You just find your new normal. You can't box it in to one experience or one set of a process. It is a life event. It is. It's a life. Yeah, it's a life event. It's different for everybody. There are some common things. I think the most important thing for people to know is that almost every grief experience is normal because one of the worst things about grief is when you think you're also losing your mind so all uh, the symptoms of grief can be so it can feel so wacky i i remember one mom coming in to see me and talking about how she for several hours a day was hiding in the bottom of her closet covered in coats sobbing so she's of course miserable with grief but she's also worried like is there something wrong with me that I'm hiding in the closet and crying and I said no you had something horrible happen it's okay that you're you're in the closet crying now if it's five years later and you're still in the closet crying okay grief tends the symptoms of grief tend to get easier with time that's what you want to see and functioning in improves but grief has a wide range of normal that I think it's really important to understand that. And I'm guessing that's so important to say, to just destigmatize that process so that people can continue through it and yes. get, to the, get to the pieces that you mentioned are the healing. And, yes. And the, the, not necessarily moving on. I don't know how right. to use those words. Yeah. The acceptance and the, the, getting the, growth, to, the growth. Getting to a point where mm-hmm. at least you can, you can function and make your own meaning of whatever it's going to be. And I, you, know, ask, you asked me the question about, you know, why is it important to pay attention to grief? I think why that's important is because if we understand that someone is grieving, including ourselves, we will adjust our expectations and we will implement supportive strategies. That's why it's important to pay attention to it. And it must be very important to pay attention when children are experiencing mm-hmm. grief because they're at such an early developmental stage. So mm-hmm. is it different how 
children are typically impacted by a loss yeah. and grieving? Yeah, children, it's actually super interesting to consider. Let me, let me just back up a little. Grief in children does not look like grief in adults or even grief in teenagers. So typically what we see with children is that their grief is going to be based on their developmental understanding of the loss. So I'll give you an example. I saw a 13-year-old boy whose mother had committed suicide when he was an infant. When he was an infant, he didn't really experience any grief. But once he got to about age 12 and 13, he understood that loss in a really different way than he did when he was six months old, of course. And so some, sometimes people will make the mistake of saying, I don't know why this is affecting this child so much now. It's been 10 years since it happened. Well, because 10 years in the life of a child makes a whole big difference of how they understand the world and they, how they understand the implications of the loss. So it suddenly occurs to them, oh, wait, I'm not going to have a dad to walk me down the aisle. I don't have a mom to be the grandmother of my children. So at whatever point in development a child starts to understand or a teenager starts to understand the implications of the loss to them, then it's normal to see symptoms pop up and for the loss to feel like it just happened because the loss of my mom at graduation, that did just happen to me yesterday, even if my mom died 20 years ago. So that's important when we think about children. Children also, in addition to the fact that development impacts their understanding and their expression of grief, Another thing that's different about kids is that they tend to grieve in pieces. So what that means is that they'll be fine. <laughs> they'll, they'll be completely fine. And then, then they're not. And then they're fine again. And so it's really easy to think, all right, this kid is losing it, or this kid doesn't care, or there's something wrong, or, but no, they're, I mean, and so they're sobbing hysterically. I want my mom. I want my mom oh, you know, I'm going to go ride my bike now. And that is completely normal. Hmm. It's like they can only handle this much grief and then, okay, I can't handle anymore. I need to go play. So that's something that's different. Typically adults, it's more pervasive. With kids, it's a more on and off or in pieces way of grieving. The other thing that's different is that with children, you typically see their grief in their behavior because they don't typically have the words or the ability to express how they're feeling. So it's normal to see it in their play or their behavior. And that's different than adults, usually. So. Yeah, I mean, to sum that up, it's you've got the grieving, kind of, it sounds like what you're saying is it happens anew, kind of fresh at each yes. stage of development. And as yes. you kind of come into different pieces of your life, you understand what that loss means at a different level. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And doesn't that make like perfect sense? Mm -hmm. You know, it really, it really does. <clears throat> does. You know, the other thing that makes grief hard for children is grieving adults. And so, in fact, if you talk to grieving children as I have, many, 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 many of them, they will tell you that. To see grown-ups cry, to see grown-ups grieving is so hard. I'll never forget doing a grief group and having a nine-year-old look around when we were doing some kind of like check-in and saying, my parents cry all the time and it is so annoying. Mm. And everybody nodded their head. They all knew exactly what that kid was talking about. And so what's really hard is that you want the parents to grieve. They need to grieve. The adults need to grieve. And then on the other hand, the kids need a break from the grief. They, they really do. And they also need something to do for the parent grief. The that is so that makes them feel so helpless when an adult is grieving and they don't really know what to do. So grieving adults are really hard. So a bereaved child often lives in a grieving home, which complicates their grief. Absolutely. And so what you'll see is that the children will sort of sit tight, almost like a frozen state until the adults are better coping with their grief. And then the children, it's like, okay, now it's my turn. And, you, and that's not uncommon either to see, that the child's grief, not just based on development, but just that there is now emotional space within a family 
for their grief to come out. Yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely hope that that is the, the, what most kids do. I would also fear that many would learn to say, well, you know, my needs and my process isn't as important. I'm right. not going to ask. Right, uh, right. And, they, and you know, it's really normal for children to want to take care of the adults. And when you're a grieving parent or adult, you're not bad because you can't manage everything. I mean, it, it's part of lowering the expectations. And so that's why it can be very important to solicit some help from trusted people who have a little distance from the loss who can give the children breaks from the grieving house. And that's why children often are ready to go back to school the next mm. day. Because it's like, okay, well, they're not crying there. So they're happy to go to school. And, and sometimes, again, parents misunderstand or adults will misunderstand that that means they don't care. Oh, no, it means they need a break. They want to get back to normal. So just being able to give children some non-tears <laughs> space, some non-grief space is really important. You need to make space for the grief. You need to make space for the for kid the to not, be a kid. Right, for, yeah. the not, for non-grief. Yeah, right. absolutely. They need space to be a kid. So as we're talking, I'm wondering what's going on in the brain during this grief process, and especially like for a kid, like how does that affect their development? Well, you know, honestly, with kids in grief, what I say, because people always worry about this, is like, oh my gosh, I got to get my kid into grief counseling. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, no, actually you don't. If you have $100 to spend on grief in your family, 95 of it needs to go to the adults. Because the truth is, yeah, you can bring your kid to me as a grief counselor and I will educate them. And mostly what I'm going to do is support them in living in a grieving house. So the sooner the adults can sort of be relatively okay, the better. So it's really the adults that are the key to a child successfully managing grief. Most kids do, you know, they're, they're okay. Good. It's super tough for kids to have grieving adults around them. And the, and the adults are the ones they're going to be interacting with and going through that process with. With these kids. One thing that really struck me from this first part of our conversation was that at a basic level, any loss can precipitate grief and any change can precipitate loss. Those were Marianne's words, and they seem to me important to remember so as not to trivialize anyone's experience of grief. So thanks for listening to this part one of our grief and loss episode. Cue up part two, and you can hear even more, as well as how to apply some of this information and get some great advice for helping families and children in need. So I'll see you then. <laughs>